sleep. I lie in bed and I count my names. Humans, they only get so many names. Their eyes open to the world and the first thing they see is a face that names them. And that's it. They're set. As they grow, they start swapping out parts, adding titles, snipping off syllables. Sometimes they delete their name completely and choose one for themselves. I like those humans. They're my people. Tech pixies don't work like that. We take so many names over the course of our lives. We'll have one for a while, but then something will call to us. Some small, perfect thing. A circuit, a gate, a blade. It shines a little brighter than everything else. The word enters us, unfolds within us, becomes a name. The world changes around the object and, and we change with it. Most of us don't like to dwell on the old names in the same way that humans don't like to think too much about their younger selves. It's kind of embarrassing that once upon a time a millstone called to one of us or a feather quill. But hey, thread rippers, now those are cool. Lately though, it feels like another change is coming. A different kind of name. One that's mine. Partner! Thread, you can just call me Valentine. Or counselor. Or ambassador of sexy tail. I'm not calling you that. Could you get Eris to call me that? She's not going for it, and I think she just needs a little push. How about ambassador of putting a plate under your sandwich? You're getting crumbs all over your desk. Aha! I've worked out a solution. I sweep the crumbs off the desk and magically banish them to a dimension where my enemies live. No muss, no fuss, and my enemies have to sweep up my crumbs. I sweep up your crumbs, partner. A service which, for your information, I am no longer providing. So that spell I bought of Zero Day wasn't legit, and now that I say those words out loud in that order, I should have known better. The spell... The floor is covered in crumbs! Ooh, sorry. I came in a little hot there. Just get a plate. No. What's in the box you're holding? New business card day! Complete with new logo of my design, thank you very much, and a special pebble texture that screams class. Just listen, class. That's more than I can say for the rest of this operation. Floor's full of crumbs, for starters. Oh my goodness, take a look. Valentine and Draper Investigations. We believe you. Hold up, who's Draper? Flip the card. Teresa Draper. Partner. Who's that now? It's my human name. But you're not, you know, human. You're a two-foot winged sprite who commands the currents of magic and knows how to run the antivirus software on my PC. I know that, but I figured that if I'm going to be a full partner in this business, I need a human name when I'm dealing with normies. I mean, yeah, but... Teresa? You can call me Teresa. Terry, if that makes it easier. It doesn't. Unless you're inviting me to go down to the Regal Beagle for a drink. The Regal what? The Regal Beagle. Where Jack and Janet and Chrissy used to go for a pint. And then Terry after Chrissy left the show. Oh, for the love of radio, Valentine! Are you actually making a Threes Company reference? From the unfunny later seasons when Priscilla Barnes replaced Suzanne Summers as Terry Alden? You know what, Priscilla Barnes does some solid work as an approachable but no-nonsense character who had to fit into an entrenched dynamic whilst navigating notable onset tensions, and when did you get here in the first place? I heard you being old all the way from the downtown plaza, and I had to come here to stop you. I'm functionally immortal, and even I know not to drone around about 80s sitcoms. Ugh, fine. No more Three's Company references. Or Cheers. Cheers is more than a comedy. It is an incisive examination of alternative working class social structures for adult men in the 1980s and I see what you're talking about. Well, I have to go. I'm in the middle of a pie eating contest right now and I'm only five pies ahead. 
I'll snag you an extra pie thread. Uh, not for you, though, Wiggly. It's always something with that chartreuse chump. True, but I get pie later. I might even share. Uh, hello? Is this Valentine Investigations? Like the sign on the door says, mate. The... Uh, there's no sign on the door. Still? Ah, welcome to Valentine and Draper Investigations. Can I take your coat? What? Oh, sure. You guys really roll out the red carpet here, don't you? Or is it down, Mr... Oh, I'm, I'm James Petrosky. People call me Jimmy, or just Guy. That's your nickname? Guy? I'm that guy. That's what people say, as in, Hey, Guy, how's it going? Can you get out of the way, Guy? I'm trying to order an Americano. Can you sign these divorce papers, Guy? I haven't got all day. Just kidding. My wife didn't say that to me. Her lawyer just handed me the papers. (laughs) Wow. Is it hot in here, or did I already give you my coat? Okay, that was... informative. I'm Finn Valentine. <clears throat> and this is my associate, Teresa Draper. Yes! Nice to meet you both. Never thought I'd be sitting here talking to a real private investigator. Maybe one day you will. Dare to dream, right? What? Don't pay attention to him, Mr. Petrowski. He thinks he's funny. How can we help you? Well, sure. Uh, Sorry to blabber. I I get nervous. I do that. Blabber. Oh, right. Why am I here? I guess you could say I'm having dreams. You're having dreams? That's right. Well, you've come to the right place. The thread, I mean, um, Teresa? Yes, boss? I mean, partner? Mr. Petrosky is having dreams. So that means we need to get the... Uh, sorry, why are you here again? Maybe his dreams are disturbing. Boy, howdy. They are corkers. I am murdering a lot of people in them. You're murdering people? Yes, but these aren't like the usual murder dreams. These ones are modern. Oh, of course. Unlike the very normal period piece murder dreams. Exactly. I'm used to those dreams where you find yourself in ancient Mesopotamia or Elizabethan England and you're killing people. But these ones are taking place in the Queen City. And get this, I'm dressed exactly as you see me right now. I can see many ways in which that would be unnerving. But here's the kicker. Do you keep up with the news? We read the papers, yeah. Two weeks ago, a murder happened in Lakeview. Man and a woman happened in a third floor suite. I read about that. It's kind of gruesome. Right? Well, I dreamed about it. Uh Uh-huh. Not to diminish your pain, Jimmy, but I dreamed about the Titanic sinking once. Yet, I didn't feel the need to call up Leonardo DiCaprio. Did you dream about the Titanic on the night it happened? Because that's what happened to me. You dreamt about the Titanic as well? No, dummy. He dreamt about the murder on the night that it happened. Ah, yeah, that makes much more sense. I hate to ask, but can you account for your whereabouts on that evening? I was on a business trip to the Saskatoon office. I have receipts from the hotel if you need to see them. And my notes I wrote that night for the ASMR videos, I'm planning to... No need. We're not cops, Mr. Petrosky. You're a paying client. You are, right? Paying? Oh, yes. Whatever you charge for a case like this. Look, I know you're not a typical PI agency. You take on cases that don't make a lot of sense. I was there. I feel it. But I also know that I was in a room at the Best Bro in Saskatoon. Is $500 per day enough? I have enough cash for a week in advance. <coughs> that's, uh, that's um, very reasonable. Because I can pay more if that's what it takes. 
No, 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 no. I'm, well, I mean, <laughs> you, you, you could, but, but no, no, no. Um, uh, $500 a day is perfectly acceptable. Um, uh, j- yeah, j- just, just, just sign this contract here and here. Don't bother with the section about your immortal soul. That's for different clientele. Uh, we're going to get started on your case right away. Uh, why don't you head back home for the moment? In the meantime, I need you to write down these dreams of yours. Everything you can remember, even from your old time in murder sprees. I, I don't get why this is happening to me. I'm just a guy. I'm sure we'll find out it's nothing. Some psychic antenna in your head got tuned to the wrong station. Now you're getting the free cable channel, but not the good kind. I bet you just need the uh, metaphysical equivalent of a chiropractor. A chiromancer. You think so? Absolutely. Now, Mr. Petrosky, if you will step over here, we'll take a photo of you for our files. Uh, that's a little weird. Smile! Oh, woo, bright. Well, thank you both for your help. I already feel five pounds lighter. Uh, here's your coat. There's those five pounds. Guess I have to go back on the exercise bike after all. Bye for now. You think it's just a loose psychic antenna? Oh, of course not. The guy's a horror show all on his own. There's a killer serving him nightmares. Did you go through his coat? Valentine, what do you take me for? Savvy investigator? Correct. I went through every pocket. What'd you find? Nothing. What about his wallet? No wallet, no keys, no receipts, no garbage. Not even lint. The only thing I found was the price tag which I kept. He paid $119 at the bay. Okay. So he overpaid for a new coat and didn't bother to remove the tag. Maybe he left his wallet in another coat? That's not the weirdest thing in the world. Valentine, were you even looking at him? His shirt still had wrinkles from the store. His pants are a quarter inch too short, and his shoes are right out of the box. It's why I took a picture of him. He looked brand new. Well, he must have given us something to go on. He claimed he was in Saskatoon on a business trip. Where did he say he worked? He didn't. And he didn't say how he knew about us. Good point. Usually when normies knock on our door, they've got a song and dance about some friend's cousin's girlfriend who knows a witch who knows us. Hmm. Well, we're not completely lost here. I have a photo of him, and I know some people who can help. Let's gear up and head out, then. Oh, sorry, Valentine. Where I'm going, you can't follow. Where? The pits of the abyss? Zero Days failed arcade slash beatboxing karaoke bar? The Denny's out by the crematorium? Oh, that is the worst Denny's of history. How did they take something already terrible and make it worse? I swear, that's normie magic in action. I'll call when I've got something. To outsiders, the last round looks like a store selling planters and wrought iron garden decorations. If you're a supernatural, though, it's the skeeziest, most run-down, most awesome bar in the city. It's my favorite place in town to get a drink, especially since they rescued some old arcade games from Wonderland Amusements. Most importantly, I know some sources there who could always help me out. Plus, the owner loves me. Get out! You're banned! For your next three lives! Griff, it's me! Do you know what your friends did to this place last time they were here? Your pink-haired tube sock of a friend threw another shifter through the window! Maybe it's the other way around. I don't remember. The point is, it took me weeks to repair the storefront illusion. The city hall goblins nearly shut me down. You're all banned! Griff, I'm here on my own. Valentine's at home. Or possibly getting drunk somewhere else. You're sure? No street magicians or vampires or, or shifters waiting outside? Just little old me. Oh, all right. In you go, then. I can't stay mad at you, little pixie. Of course not. I'm adorable. Is the detective in? When isn't he? Usual booth in the back. Take him this Ampletini, would you? 
Feels like I'm doing a community service here. I head into the back, looking for my source. One of the nice things about the last round is that I don't need my human glamour here. It's a place where everyone can shed their disguise and simply be themselves. It's not always pretty, though. Yoo-hoo, Mr. Threadripper. Hi, GD. So good to see you. GD, or the Great Dead Detective, is a fixture at the last round. He's a revenant held together with staples and glue and ballistic gel. Someone murdered him decades ago, and he has been trying to piece his past together ever since. But mostly he sits at his booth playing cards and drinking apple teenies. Lucky for me, he's a pretty good detective. When Valentine or I have run into a wall, GD always finds a window to crawl through. Ooh, is that my apple teeny? <sighs> Can you actually taste your drinks? I suspect that if I had the power of taste, I would not enjoy grist cocktails as much. Can I get an apple teeny too? So, what brings you here? And where is your boss? He's my partner now. See? New business cards and everything. Hmm. I see you've adopted a human name. Congratulations on making such a change under your own volition. I keep intending to come up with a regular name, but I enjoy the way G.D. sounds. So do I. Perhaps I will call myself Gaster Dillahunt or Growly Dump Truck. I'd stick with G.D. Very well. What can I help you with? We just took on a client who's having violent dreams that seem to be happening in real life. Perhaps they have latent clairvoyant powers, and they're picking up on the psychic disturbance? I considered that, but this guy feels... wrong. He had no ID, his clothes were a day old at most, and I can't find him anywhere on the internet. Like, weird. The only evidence I have of his existence is a price tag from his coat and a photo on my phone. Here, here, look. Hmm. He looks normal enough to me. You need someone who can see past appearances. Do you know a seer? Can we get them here on short notice? How much will it cost? It'll cost you at least one apple teeny. I turn around to see Iffy wearing an apron and holding two cocktails. We ran into Iffy a while back at O'Hanlon's. She didn't know it then, but she was a street magician. A human with hidden supernatural powers that often bloom when they hit their teenage years. For a lot of people, it's a tough transition full of turmoil, meds, and institutions. The lucky ones meet the right folks and break free. Iffy crossed our path at just the right moment. Is one of those drinks for me? It's for me. I'm on my break. Griff, I'm taking my break. He's such a pushover. Iffy, you work here? Part-time. I had to take a hiatus from school and learn to control my sight. It's hard to stay calm when the Queen City looks like the spirit world. I don't know. It sounds kind of nice. Not when I could see my stats professor getting his soul devoured by a parasitic entity from another dimension. What was I supposed to do? Run up and start swatting the air around his head? Probably not the best option. But you did it anyway, didn't you? I was strongly advised to take some time off. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. It's... okay. I wandered by the last round, saw the help wanted sign, which Griff insisted wasn't there, but I had bartending experience, so he gave me a job. The tips are... really weird. Now, do you need me to look at something? This Albertini is on your tab, by the way. I figured. Take a look at this guy in this photo. Which one? What do you mean? I mean, 
Which of the two men in the picture do you want me to look at? No, I... Wait, I, I only see one guy. Th this one here? Glasses, store-bought shirt, pleated pants, semi-transparent? Semi-what? Uh, look closer. Huh. Yeah, he is kind of... see-through? Of course! Your client is a cutout. A cutout? When some magicians need to hide from enemies, or in this case, the authorities, they create a false persona and hide themselves within it. Even the most sophisticated attempts to find the person generally come up fruitless. It seems Miss Iffy's town is even more helpful than we first imagined. I know about that spell, but the Accords banned its use ages ago. You can't create a new person out of thin air. Once that happens, they're actual people. Murdering them is like... like... Murder? Precisely. You're creating someone only to give them a little life, then snuff it out at your whim. How do we break the spell? The spell is simple to cast, but very hard to break. The caster locks him or herself inside with the key. The only way to break it from our end, regrettably, is to convince the cutout to undo it. That sounds awful. They rarely take the news well. What does he look like? The other one in the photo. I don't know. What do you mean, you don't know? He doesn't want me to see him. It's like he's hiding himself from me in plain sight. It, it hurts to look. An effect of the cutout spell. Pinch your nose and believe back. Guys, he can see us. Who? The other one. He's looking at us right now through the photo. I think he knows what we're saying. This is unfortunate. He will be able to find us now, wherever we go. We must relocate to a blind spot. Some place where magic can't go? Quite the opposite. A place where there is so much spiritual energy that we will be like candle flames in the heart of a bonfire. I don't know if I can do that. When there's too much magic, it's hard for me to keep track of what's... real. Different places, different times, other people's memories and dreams, they start jumbling together in my head. You can do it, Iffy. I have a feeling we're gonna need you for whatever comes next. No matter where we end up... Wait, where are we going? The museum, of course. Where else? You have been listening to The Graveyard Tapes, part one of The Cutout, written by Aiden Morgan, edited by Angela Dumalog, produced by Brianna Jean, featuring Chase Hunter as Valentine, Rick the Whitebird as Threadripper, Angela Dumalog as Zero Day, Patrick Mendelson as James Guy Petrosky, Zach Tuttle Rob as the Great Dead Detective, Taylor Humanay as Iffy, and Devin as Griff.